the report. Open. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, um, we ask that you please drop it in the chat um, and we'll be holding and moderating a short Q&A at the end of the presentation as well. Um, so just introducing the Kali'oko Pa'akai Collective, it's a community of practice of advocates in Vahikupuna stewardship that was created from the need to organize our shared ideas, resources, and strategies to build capacity and take collective action in safeguarding Hawaii's Vahikupuna. The collective's purpose is to strengthen Vahikupuna stewardship through collaboration and collective efforts. Um, our vision is empowered communities, um, restoring, reinvigorating, and stewarding Hawaii's Vahikupuna. And our mission is to collectively activate and fulfill our kuleana to protect Hawaii's Vahikupuna and Ike Kupuna. Um, and our kahea, our call to action, is to build a system that truly protects Vahikupuna and empowers community led stewardship um, by reconceptualizing cultural resource management as Vahikupuna stewardship and exploring culturally grounded and meaningful pres preservation practices. Um, and we're here today. I'm going to give um, brief introductions to our awesome presenters. Um, first, we have John Tolchin. Um, John has nearly two decades of experience in the realm of cultural resource management. He is the manager of Kuemeha School's Vahikupuna program, responsible for the stewardship and care of nearly 5,000 cultural sites located across Hawaii. Um, the program strives to reactivate Vahikupuna to connect the current generation with their ancestral past and to provide a inspiration and guidance for our future. Um, following John, we have Trevor Duarte. Trevor was born and raised in the Ahupua'a of He'eia O'ahu. He has 13 years of experience in Hawaiian archaeology and currently serves as a cultural resource manager in, in Kuemeha School's Vahikupuna program. His appreciation for his kupuna, their relationship to the environment, and their craftsmanship continues to grow with each project at Kuemeha School's. Um, so please join us in welcoming our presenters, John and Trevor. And then, yeah. Follow for the intro, Amber. All right, let's get started. Um, Aloha Kako. Uh, my name is John Tolchin, and I manage the Kamehameha School Vahikupuna program, which is our cultural resources program uh, responsible for stewarding uh, cultural sites or Vahikupuna across um, KS Aina. I'm joined by Trevor Duart. He's going to help with this presentation. Uh, he's also a cultural resources manager for Kamehameha Schools and has been a leading force for managing our Koyahana. So happy to have him here today to join me. And with that, we're happy to share about uh, Koyahana stewardship that Kamehameha Schools is involved in. The quick agenda of some of the Did we lose him? <clears throat> Trevor, John? Uh, oh, there he is. I think he got kicked out. Okay. <laughs> so, so John, uh, returns. Uh, I'll continue on with the show here. Uh, the agenda today, we're looking at the history of the oh, KS collection, uh, the artifacts um, curated and managed, and, and some of the methods that we uh, use for that. Um, some of we'll also go into a few instances where we've conducted collections based research with the Koihana and uh, a few of the interpretive displays that occurred uh, that were generated off of a few uh, from the internship program with the Bishop Museum as well. Uh, finally, we have uh, these last two, the educational workshops, we'll kind of just briefly highlight a few of those instances and uh, the internship programs as well. And then finally, John will talk about the 3D modeling and printing and kind of give us a tour through some of uh, the digital platforms of of Koihana that uh, KS 
has begun to engage with and, and share with, uh, with a wider audience. Uh, John, you, I just got us through this slide. Oh, thanks, Trevor. Sorry about that. Technical no. difficulties on my end. <laughs> Yes, picking up for where Trevor left off. Um, before we dive into Koi Hana, I wanted to talk a little bit about Kamehameha Schools. Um, I think while many of us know about Kamehameha Schools being an educational trust for Native Hawaiians created by Princess Bernice Pauhi Bishop, we're also a land steward. Um, this map shows all of the lands that um, comprise Kamehameha Schools Aina, all of the shaded areas, the colored areas. Um, we are the largest private landowner in the state. Um, roughly, we have uh, 364,000 acres that we're responsible to steward. Uh, most of these lands are undeveloped and they contain you know, native forests, a large part of the state's watershed, coastal lands, wetlands, and throughout all of that, there's Vahipana and Vahikupuna, so all of which Kamehameha schools collectively stewards. Um, again, this map is great because it shows um, all of the KS Aina and how Pauahi came to inherit all of these lands, uh, looking at the color charts. Uh, for this presentation, we're primarily going to be talking about Oahu and Hawaii Island, with the bulk of the collections coming from West Hawaii, uh, Kaupulehu, Keho, and Kahalu'u in particular, a little bit. Um, and Ka'u, the Waiahukini Pakini area in the southern part of Hawaii Island. Next slide, Trevor. Thanks. A little bit about the KS Wahikupuna program. Uh, we've been around now for about two decades. Um, again, we're responsible for the protection and management of Wahikupuna, Koihana and all of the land legacy information, the research reports, uh, geospatial information, everything kind of related to Vatikupuna and the documentation of it. Um, we conduct archeological and ethnohistoric research to support committee engagement, education and restoration efforts. Um, when necessary, um, we're involved in mitigating threats or impacts that may have occurred because of environmental or man-made impacts. And finally, we like to promote sustainable use of Wahikupuna for community, community stewardship and Aina-based learning. This is a quick snapshot of the Wahikupuna that we steward at a very high level. Uh, we currently have almost 5,000 cultural sites or Wahikupuna inventoried across KS Aina. Um, and the number continues to grow. We still have many areas that we haven't investigated yet. So continue to learn more about our Aina. These sites range from heiau, fish ponds, uh, petroglyphs, trails, traditional fishing villages, agricultural field systems. Um, the sites are very diverse in size and significance. Um, you know, one site could consist of a small house platform where another could be a section of the Kona field system, which would be you know, 300 acres and comprise thousands of component features. So huge spread of sites that we're involved in, in caring for. Uh, for this pre presentation, we're gonna focus on Koyahana uh, or artifacts. Um, currently we have uh, 75,000 Koyahana inventoried. It's kind of split between two main I guess, curation facilities. The first is in West Hawaii, KS uh, directly manages our own curation facility based in Kona, um, associated with collections from Keoho, Kahalu'u, and Kaupulehu with a couple of other locations as well. And that probably comprises about 25,000 artifacts. The second uh, curation facility is at the Bishop Museum where there's about 50,000 artifacts that are being curated at the Bishop Museum, uh, artifacts originating from KS Aina associated with various uh, research projects that the museum conducted many decades ago. Um, in terms of context, all of these materials are related to uh, archeological projects. So they come from you know, archeological excavations. 
And with that, I'm going to turn over to Trevor. He's going to do a deep dive into Koihana and some of the management strategies that we have. Mahalo, John, and aloha, everyone. Uh, so today, we are looking at uh, Koihana stewardship. And so right off the gate, we want to do some definitions. What is Koihana, right? So uh, this definition is what we've, we've kind of used, the tangible remains or the artifacts of our culture and history as they embody direct links to our kupuna. Uh, Koihana present us with a rich cultural knowledge that can be used to appreciate and strengthen our understanding and connection to the past. So what does, what does that all mean? What, what do we think about when we think of Hawaiian artifacts or, or Koihana? What do we think of? A, a lot of times the first things that pop up to our mind is, is things like the, the ki'i, right? The large ki'i or some beautiful, uh, you know, beautiful pendants or ads, you know, ads and things like that. Uh, and they all are, they are definitely koihana. But in the stewardship of koihana, those are just a portion of the things that we are caring for. A majority of them, when they do their archaeological excavations and when these materials are discovered, they consist of a snapshot of the lifestyle or the the day-to-day -day life that was was occurring at those locations. So we'll see things, a lot of things are related to uh, uh, items such as mea'ai, you know, like shellfish, ia, pua'a, or things like charcoal, a large, a hefty amount of firewood, or byproducts of, of crafting and, and reducing down rocks to generate uh, a beautiful ads and things and other tool items. So the koihana um, is, is a vast array of these, these different uh, items and, and it consists of all these, a wide range of things. Um, but they, and all of them provide us with insight of what kupuna, how they were engaging with their environment, what they were doing at that period of time. Um, some objects were items in, that were used, that were personal items that were used and incorporated in daily life for a particular individual or maybe perhaps a group that interacted with that object and the aina. Things like urchin spine uh, files, scrapers and grinding stones. And, but unfortunately, what happens to nearly 99% of the time is that archeological materials are collected. Uh, they're, they're collected from the site, they're screened and sorted through, organized, and then they're bagged, identified, inventoried, and perhaps a photograph to present in a report generated in a table of all the, the materials that were collected. And then they're left on a box on a shelf. And so the KS Wahi Kupuna program has recognized the importance of these koihana, the tangible items of the past, and recognizes also that there is a kuleana of caring for collections and see a number of ways that uh, we can increase engagement with the koihana as a benefit for this generation and the next. Um, in some cases, all that remains of the Vahikupuna or, or these archeological sites are the, are the Koihana. And, in, and so they serve a great need in that, in that being able to tell the story of some of those locations and those, those sites. Um, in other instances, the access to some of the sites are, are so remote and difficult to get to that the items from the koihana items themselves become a, a way of being able to connect to back to place for kupuna and, and others that cannot reach that, those locations and, and just generally and accessible to a broader range of uh, audience at that point. Yeah. So koihana is important and we recognize that. Um, one of the first thing that needs to happen in the care of koihana is to actually identify where they are located. Because some of these, a lot of times these boxes are hiding amongst uh, many different places and, and somewhat, somewhat kind of in back of mind as well, you know, out of sight, out of mind in some ways. So uh, we, need to, we needed to identify where they were located. And the Bishop Museum, which happens to be uh, the co previous uh, Kamehameha School's campus uh, long ago, it also has a connection to our program as it currently holds uh, as John stated, many archaeological collections that originated from uh, Aina o Powahi across the Pai Aina. So in, in, um, we, we've reached out to them and have been able to engage with 
with the collections and uh, we've learned we've learned a tremendous amount about uh, the resources on the Aina through uh, through being able to see the Koihana again. So um, mahalo to Bishop Museum. There we go. And so these are a few of the collections that we are uh, we have recognized from the, the that occurred on KS Aina that are within the Bishop Museum's archaeological department. Um, maybe roughly around 20 projects or so, Bishop, previous Bishop Museum archaeological projects that contained uh, Koihana from Kies Aina. Uh, these include uh, Waiahu Kini in Ka'u. It's a, uh, probably the largest uh, collection that we know of, uh, robust one, tons of uh, fish hooks and, and just a lot of Koihana to, to manage and care for. Uh, then there's also Punalu'u in Ka'u. We also have uh, Anahulu in Kawailoa. That's probably our largest one for Oahu. And then um, Kuala'a in Puna and Punalu'u in Ko'olauloa as well. So these are just a few, a handful of the collections. And uh, for some of the collections, the materials were still in bags that they came into the museum uh, 50 years ago and um, you know, needed, needed a, to be addressed and, and cared for once again. So KS decided it was an important to partner with the Bishop Museum to take care of these materials uh, because, because we recognize that they were so um, important to telling the story of these places. And uh, working with the Bishop Museum, we came with, up with a plan together for a way to improve um, conditions, increase stewardship, and generate engagement with these Koihana. So that, that resulted in the Koihana Internship Program, phase one, as we call it. Um, so this, again, the partnership with, uh, included U UH Manoa, Bishop Museum, and KS to provide credited internship for students to have a hands-on learning experience in collections management. So they, they were able to see the whole process of discovering the, uh, the, con the current condition of the materials seeing what needed to be, how it needed to be improved, um, and then reorganizing those, making all the corrections in the database and, and ensuring that the data is correct, and then going through the, the digital files um, or, or needing to, or creating the digital files of the original field forms and maps and things like that, um, and uh, just and putting this all into a database or Excel sheets for, um, for ease of access and finding things as a finding aid. Um, through all of that, six semesters, uh, through six semesters, 18 students and six displays were generated. Uh, these, these displays were um, featured in Hawaii Hall, usually for about six, six to eight months maybe, um, and the, with, with a beautiful showcasing of, uh, of it, and uh, it would rotate. So we would, we would have uh, one semester show, show theirs, and then the next one would be right behind it. Um, all in all, 10,000, Objects were rehoused and digitized, rehoused, and then the digitization of 3,500 archival materials. So it was a really great experience, and I had a lot of good exposure for uh, the students uh, as well in in collections-based management. So at this time, I'm, we're going to show a series of slides um, that showcase the exhibits that were generated by the the cohorts. Uh, so in the spring of 2018, we have the Namakau o Waiahukini, or the fish hooks of Waiahukini. Uh, this is probably one of the most uh, southern points of the Pai Aina and is also associated as one of the residents of Kumemea's uncle, uh, Kalani Opu'u. And from uh, pre contact through the historic period, the Kahakai portion had a well established fishing village. Um, in about 1968, or sorry, 1868, the Mauna Loa eruption brought lava to the shores. But miraculously, the, it spared the fishing village. Um, and then fast forward to about the 1960s, you see uh, Emery and Sonoto, the archaeologist with the Bishop Museum, excavated the rock shelters of Waiahukini um, along uh, nearby the coast and came across one of the most uh, str heavily stratified um, sites excavated in the state um, as well. And, and from that, a, a robust fish hook assemblage. Uh, in fact, it was so so robust that Emery and Sonoto conducted the in-depth research on Hawaiian fish hook types, which still is probably the leading resource it, of uh, for for learning on uh, Hawaiian fish hooks. 
Um, the students did a really great job with this display uh, as they weave multiple strands of EK, but put it presented in a, a, a palatable way for the audience, a visual way too for the audience. Um, so we have the Macau production on this upper left hand corner. And then you also have uh, the typology, the notched and knobs um, and various ones in between kind of showcasing that. Then we have uh, individual levels and layers or, uh, that are presented showing the changes, uh, the, different, the different fish hooks that were presented in each of them. And then the changes over time, you can kind of visually get to see that. So really interesting way of, of uh, presenting it, right? Uh, for for audience and and give them a little bit of uh, archae archaeology um, kind of foundational elements as well in it. So really good job. Uh, this this was a nice touch as well. The native fish species on the bottom were uh, the, from recovered from the faunal uh, assemblages of uh, at, during this excavation, and they also uh, point to the probable fishes. Uh, uh, Probable, probable fishes that were eaten and consumed uh, during this time and uh, likely from, from these uh, fish hooks as well. So that was spring 2018. Oh, we just couldn't get away from Waiahukini and all its uh, splendor of, of, of Koihana. Um, we wanted to highlight and celebrate the, uh, the Koihana again. And so Hanaho, summer of 2018, we did, uh, the students decided to do the Waiahukini Ho'is. So the Ko'is of Wahukini, it's interesting there, I do not believe that there is a source for, uh, for this type of dense basalt uh, in the Wahukini area, it, 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 you know, in the near proximity area. Uh, so this is a great visual to show uh, the, the distance and range that uh, was traveled and, and just the knowledge of knowing where all the resources, uh, the type, the specific type of resources, uh, dense fine green basalt, uh, Pohaku, that uh, Kupuna were looking for in crafting their, their many ko'is uh, of different shapes and sizes um, for, uh, to, to be used, to eventually be used at the Waiahukini rock shelter. Um, you see uh, some, in some cases, traveling as far as uh, Mauna Kea, so stretching far across the entire island. But then that's not it. There's even this, out, this, uh, this one that actually came from a quarry out in Kauai. So that's really cool. You get to see that they're not even limited to um, the knowledge and, and engagement with the, the other islands. Um, you know, it's, it, or it's not just re, re, uh, restricted to just within their own uh, Mokupuni. It's actually expanded to the uh, Pai Aina and the, the knowledges and goods of transfer at that point, right? So really interesting, um, great look at geochemistry and, and its, uh, its ability to uh, share more um, insight onto how the kupuna were in, um, interacting. Yeah. Then in the spring of 2019, uh, following the eruption of Kilauea, uh, Pele covered the coast, coastal areas and spread all over the Bahi Kupuna sites there. Um, and one of those areas uh, was Pua'a'a, and which had a, a fabulous uh, fishing village. It was proposed uh, that KS focus on this aina and the moko puna as the Koihana is actually, this is a case where the Koihana is now that all that remains of these this sites, of the sites that were once present there uh, within the coastal uh, Hala forest. Um, though only a few of the Koihana were collected from the project or, or actually present from the project, a display was generated to highlight um, some of the Vahikupuna sites, traditions, and, and it also included an intriguing pohaku which possibly was a sinker or a ba'a breaker from uh, Pua'ala'a. So really nicely done in um, Pua'ala'a. Finally, for the fall of 2019, we focused on Punalu'u Oahu. Uh, this is also a very unique collection as the materials were not discovered during excavation. Rather, these were discovered while diving near the coast. So, Every item on this collection exhibits signs of coral or crustaceous growth on them. You can kind of see that. And it was actually on our first slide too that showed all of the, the various um, ulumaikas and uh, uh, sling stones on that photo. Um, but a lot of them are intact and uh, they feature such items as uh, pohaku pu'i'ai. You can see that on the uh, right-hand corner, lower right-hand corner. Uh, mica stones, uh, sling stones as well. 
And a, a one that's not that common uh, is this polished basalt disc mirror, which is a very interesting um, Koihana piece. So um, just a very interesting assemblage. Uh, and we were just really interested in learning, learning more. And we continue to uh, have interest in understanding this, uh, this collection a lot more. So that's that concludes our our little dive, our little segue into the, the exhibits that were generated by phase one. Now we return back to phase two, uh, where we're currently working on um, the intern the internship program with Bishop Museum. Uh, we right now we have two full-time paid internships, and the pivot is just basically to focus more on improving collections management and preservation. So more more of the um, bringing our the materials the koihana care up to speed um and this also still increases uh access to the collections and it also provides entry-level museum career experiences in hawaii something that we we recognized didn't uh wasn't wasn't as uh, common as as we'd like to see or or we we hope to just support that and bolster bolster that area um, with this program so uh to Two uh, great interns right now working really hard at um, going through the collections. Uh, they also shared during the Shaw conference um, not too long ago, about a month ago. So uh, some of you may have may have been able to actually see their presentations and recall that. So that it was the Bishop Museum collection. That was a portion of it. I think that captures about fifty thousand of the the artifacts, the Poihana there. And now we shift over to again looking for or recognizing where the koihana are that's the first step right so where 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 is the koihana where is it located uh this what this actually these two collections the keoho kahalu and kaupu lehu collections actually are um under direct management by the ks Kupuna program and this the collections actually originated from uh as we as the KS was informed that the PHRI, uh, Paul Rosendahl's outfit, in, in, uh, centrally located in Hilo, was uh, closing up shop and that the, the materials were being stored in a facility in uh, Hilo, just a storage facility there. And with that, um, there was a growing interest from KS as early as 2012 to, to increase, to, to learn more about this collection, take care of it, and again, it's, Try, try and look for opportunities to engage with the Koihana and share it with a, a larger audience. Um, so today, about almost a decade later, we now know that the, the collection holds over 400 boxes, um, 10,000 plus, I think that's actually more, closer to 20,000 plus bags of Koihana. And, um, and those range from, again, unsorted mid-in to a top of a historic bedpost on this far right-hand corner. Uh, umeke and Olona scraper, but just a great diversity of koihana is, is being curated uh, in this facility. Um, as it expected, the koihana was in poor condition when it was received. Uh, we had dilapidated boxes up in this, you, you can see in the upper left-hand corner, uh, upper left photo, uh, the dilapidated uh, boxes. Um, in, within that, there were broken bags, worn out ink labels, um, all these things made it a very, a very difficult, um, a very challenging um, process to piece everything back together. Um, but again, in, in, with the desire and goal to improve the conditions of the curation of this koihana, um, we, we pressed on and um, you can see the final, the, what it looks like today in this bottom corner. Um, so that, that was a, a great effort and uh, helped tremendously in being able to organize and kind of be able to get a, a large view of what, what is actually in the collections. Um, so these initial uh, efforts began in 2012, like I said, uh, with the Kaupu Lehu collection. Um, and that included uh, interns inventorying, doing some photographs, measuring, and um, initial organization of the physical materials as well as the database. So that that we had a little bit to build off of that one, and then we continued on. Um, the Keoho Kahalu one just was um, ha hadn't been looked at a whole lot, so uh, it was pretty much from scratch. In, in that, in 2016, the efforts um, when the 2016 efforts kicked in, 
Um, the facility was established, um, uh, formally established this, this curation facility and uh, the rehousing and inventorying uh, was ramped up and we were able to complete the entire 400 boxes uh, in a span of eight months by two full-time lab techs, uh, which helped with processing, um, assessing the conditions, uh, putting into appropriate bags and containers, uh, labeling, retaining original bags to, to be placed into the, um, the, or just good posterity and good record keeping, you just retain some of that. And then uh, also um, inputting the data into, the, into a database. Uh, so again, this was just a foundational effort for the West Hawaii Island Koihana uh, and the facility just to get it all organized, um, both the physical and digital um, aspects of it um, for the collection. So it's so that's where we're at now with it. Um, and so before I get to photography, uh, I just wanted to mention that there is so many factors to consider when taking care of a collection. There's, and, and you know, kind of having a facility, a curation facility, uh, it needs climate control. Uh, is it secured? Is access secured? Is it, is it, proper, is it being properly stored? Um, and then you have items that are special, that require special treatment. Um, and so all of this is under our direct management for the Bahi Kukuna. Um, a lot of it was was new territory. So, um, it, and I can give one example uh, was for wood items in particular. Um, we were, con there was concern of uh, any kind of pest when the, the moving of the materials from the storage facility into the, in, into the new uh, Koihana facility. Um, we were concerned about any kind of pest that would re reside in those wood items. So, uh, we wanted to ensure that they were free of insects, so we sought out the advice of the Bishop Museum collection staff, uh, who informed us that wood items should be placed into a cold storage for about for a couple of weeks to eliminate um, insect presence in the facility. So with that, we, we had a nice box, we rented it, and we put the koihana inside, wrapped them appropriately, made sure the temperature was just right, and made sure we weren't leaving them in too long, and uh, the items were then stored and we're happy to say that we have not noticed any insects on any of these objects today. So um, we're, we're grateful for um, being able to have ties and, and reach out to the, our friends and who, who have done some of this stuff before as well. So photography, as previously mentioned, many of the koihana from these collections have been photographed and inputted into the database. So photography is, is a great help, um, being able to see it, a photo of the items, and that it's featured on a, uh, a computer file or a digital file makes it that much easier to, to be able to see exactly what, um, what, you, what item you are trying to select or, or look for. Um, you know, it's difficult to read through general text descriptions while searching for a specific item. So a photograph says, does quite a bit in the, in the process of looking for items and, and hunting things down uh, within the facility. Um, but these, we have been working to increase the number of objects that are photographed, but they span from volcanic glass debitage to historic glass fragments to ko'i and luhe'e shells. So there's quite a bit, um, uh, there was quite a bit of, uh, photography that was completed, but a lot more to go, but really useful in, you know, as it relates or links up um, the items in the database. And here is a, a snapshot of like the, the host screen or the, the base screen for the database. And uh, here you can see that uh, there's a couple of different ways you can browse it, your assemblages, you know, as I mentioned, the Keoho Kahalu'u or the Kaupulehu ones. Um, there's also various, the various reports, the um, compliance reports that were generated for both of those areas um, throughout the you know, 40 or 50 years of the archeological work that has been conducted in those areas. That's all here. Um, and as well as the physical boxes, you can see uh, the digital or the, I guess the, the inventory of those, then as well sites, bags, artifacts. Um, the lower, lower on the screen here, educational kits is something that we're looking to in the future is to try and to create um, 
kits that we can circulate and be able to share with the community or uh, folks that are interested in, in, in understanding or having a hands-on opportunity of perhaps learning about how uh, the production of, of uh, fish hooks or what was what, what a fishing toolkit would look like from Kaupulehu. You know, those are some of the ideas that we have um, in uh, for the future. So these are kind of like placeholders for that right now. Uh, but as you can see, we have, uh, here's an example of the, the screen of, of a search. And you can see here that we have all the, the various information uh, associated with the, each item. Uh, you can see also the, how the photograph is right there. So again, speaking to the, the ability to, uh, the ease of, of being able to pull a lot of information quickly at your fingertips and, and according to the, the different type of search that you're trying to do. Um, Here's, here's an example of uh, the, how it's linked as well to the various sites. And so you can find an artifact from a certain site and then uh, pull up the site and see the map and maybe even look at, oh, where was, where were they, uh, where did this originate from? Where was the test unit? And it was right smack dab in the middle of the site. And you, know, you, can, you can see a lot of those things right, um, right at your fingertips with the, using the database and the, all the links that are provided through it. Uh, so it's a very, very, a useful tool for both management and um, collections um, re research. And that's actually where I want to go to next. I want to talk about uh, some of the opportunities that have occurred since KS has cared for Koihana. Um, we are able to, with, with caring for these materials, you're, we also have the ability to uh, have opportunities to um, conduct research um, at a group, at a at a way that we don't have to impact sites. We're actually avoiding damage to sites. As we all know, excavations are destructive as they directly impact, they do direct impact to sites. However, with collections-based research, um, it makes it possible to, to do further research without impacting a site um, or on sites that are no longer present on the surface, right? So, it's a sustainable approach to incorporating archaeological data and answering questions that uh, for today that could provide insight um, to how we do management in some of these places, how we how we manage resources in, in different places. Um, I'll go through uh, one one example uh, right now, and I think John will follow up with the second one from uh, both of which come from the KS West Hawaii Island of Koihana. So let me go. There we go. Okay, so the first one dealt with uh, funnel, funnel identification, and the community of Kaupulehu actually reached out uh, to KS and was as they were actively managing the fisheries uh, there at Kaupulehu, and there was an opportunity to for the Koihana to actually play a role and assist in that effort. So these the Koihana, the materials of Nakupuna, were actually providing information regarding to the 700 years of traditional marine subsistence management, the management and the strategies that were utilized at Kaupulehu. So with that, uh, it, we looked at those, those items that aren't so, um, aren't so you know, uh, photogenic, right? The, the materials that are the midden, the shell, the ea remains, right? Those types of things, the charcoal, and they took a deep dive into those things uh, from three Makai sites and one Malka site in Kaupulehu. And it shows over 700 years of, of management of, of the marine fisheries out there uh, by Nakupunas. So with that, um, what came out of that study was that the surgeon fish was actually the most abundant type that you saw throughout the entire span of those 700 years. And it became the target or one of the species that the tri weight community would then um, focus on as part of their studies to, to look for environmental factors of the regeneration of the reef and the growth there. So it's, a, it's really amazing to be able to have that, that kind of additional um, line, of, line of evidence or, or support from the Koihana to, to help and assist with uh, you know, our conservation efforts, our, our management of marine fisheries out there. So 
happy about that one. Uh, the wood taxa identification is was also one of the byproducts that occurred during this deep dive into collections, the Koihana collections. Uh, as they analyzed and uh, assessed um, each of the charcoals, they are actually able to um, identify what species of, of wood it was. Um, so they were engaging with uh, the whole entire forest of Kaupulehu, and uh, that has been displayed in, in the the presentation or the part of the presentation that John's going to cover for the archaeobotanical um, results of the Kaupulehu um, research project. But uh, one of the things we did find out also uh, was that they were able to uh, find a piece of, of uh, this uh, kiholo or wooden shark, shark hook that uh, fragmented and fell off of the item. And they were they put it under a uh, microscope, a uh, high, high um, High level of mark microscope, and they were able to see that uh, the wood was actually lehua. It was a uh, ohia lehua. So, um, again, it kind of gives a, another tie to um, the types of, uh, you know, the ethnobotany, how they were engaging with the different laau in the areas, and what what those materials were being used for firewood, kiholos, and other objects as well. So, really, as we as we look more into our the Koihana, it, we are being able to see more, get more and more information about uh, Nakupuna of this specific Ahupua. Yeah? And here, here we have uh, some photos of the workshops uh, with the community and some educational groups. Um, they, they range, they have a broad range. Sometimes we are able to do, um, share uh, just the Koihana or sometimes they wanna do some hands-on um, sorting, you know, some sorting techniques and just do a quick one, a, a quick dive into that. So we've been able to uh, accommodate a, um, a handful of those and they've been a really, really great opportunity for um, everybody to kind of get together. Again, in some cases, the kupuna uh, or the audience cannot all get to a site or the site, it wouldn't be appropriate to host as many people um, at a site. So the, the koihana offer an opportunity to, to kind of share to kind of share um, and have that connection, even though they're not physically at that site. So um, yeah, just an, another great way. Um, and also so uh, something that I really appreciate too is when uh, the Ohana or the Kupuna from the area are then engaging with them and you know, they, they're holding up a, a, a Macau and they're thinking that perhaps this, this was, uh, you know, great, 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 great Kupuna or Tutu, you know, from the area that, was actually, you know, this was there crafted by them or used, used by them. So just a, a great, um, great moment for, for folks to connect with um, the traditions and also um, their, their her the heritage, yeah, the culture of, of uh, Koyana in that place, so. Okay, and with that, I'm going to uh, hand it back over to John and uh, for the 3D modeling. Um, Malo, Trevor. So 3D modeling is the most recent, I guess, technique that we've been using to try and better document and preserve the collection. Um, it's turning out to be, you know, a great way, again, to preserve things in perpetuity in a digital format. Um, it provides, it's another level of access, I feel like, especially virtually. So, you know, we've been able to to select models from these collections and host them online. We have a website, ks3d.org, that's publicly accessible. It's been live now for about a year where anyone can log in and, and take a look, you know, whether it's for education, research, or just for learning, to look at some of these collections. Um, I think it's a great alternative to documentation. I think one thing that comes to mind is it's a good way of like an insurance policy. I mean, it's not as good obviously as the original object, but it's pretty close of how good the technology is to document and record. Um, I'm thinking of a couple of years ago, there was that fire in Brazil of a, a major museum and many objects were lost. And I believe in some Ahu Ula were lost and can no longer be, you know, connected with. And now with this technology, it's it's a way that you can preserve it at least digitally. And then now with the 3D printing technology, you have the ability to replicate it. Again, it's 
not as good as the original, but it's, it's a pretty good alternative. It's a good insurance policy and a good sharing tool. Um, 3D printing has been great because again, it's a, a way to reproduce replicas um, for education or research. The technology is improving, um, very detailed. It's in some ways, it's hard to tell the difference um, unless you're a professional, I think, if it's real or replica. Um, great for educational purposes because there's no concerns about loss or damage because you're dealing with a replica. In many cases, a lot of these materials are sensitive and you don't want to bring out the originals. Um, and there's also the unique ability with the 3D printing and the 3D models is to, if you have pieces missing, like say a two piece fish hook, you only have one side, you could digitally recreate the missing side and then print the fish hook as a whole. Or if you have a broken piece of an object, you can do research and reconstruct it digitally and then print it out as a whole object. Um, with that, I'm gonna transition. We're gonna to go to our, our website to actually give you some examples of some of the 3D models. So give me a second to share my screen. Okay, can everybody see? All right, so this is our, our website. Um, it highlights not only Koihana, but Vahikupuna. Um, there's various portals that highlights various sites and Vahipana and Koihana from KS Aina. It's a work in progress. We continue to add more content and try and refine the site. Um, today, we'll focus on Koihana. There's a couple of ways you can navigate in the site. Um, I like this one because I always like to know where I am in place and in space. And so these tabs represent different portals that you can navigate to that has various types of content. Um, the yellow being Vahipupuna, and what we're going to look at today is the purple, the Makao, the fish hooks uh, for Koihana. So first, we can go to Kaupulehu. And this is our Kaupulehu portal with a sampling of select uh, objects that we 3D modeled from the collection. Um, one that I like to look at is this leho that is part of a um, he'e lure. Give it some time to finish loading. Okay, so. Here's the model. Um, I think they're great in that you can you can have all the different colors and textures, you have the ability to kind of rotate and look around and explore. And apologize if anyone's getting seasick. I think it's always better if you're kind of controlling this, but just bear with me. Uh, and you're welcome. You know, once we're pow, you can log on and do this for yourself. But I think it's just amazing that you can look at the detail, you can get in there and actually look at where the shell was worked to you know, do the threading that would attach it to the lure. And you can just see all the different details. I'm gonna go back and let's look at a couple others. I like this one. Um, it's a fish hook blank or preform. It's in the process of being made. So then you have that kind of ability to kind of look at it in all angles, kind of zoom in, check areas that you're interested in, learn about it. And a lot of these that I'm showing you guys when I'm pow uh, with the website, I actually have these as examples of being 3D printed. So you can kind of check against what I'm showing you now in relation to what was 3D printed. So this is a, a smaller fish hook made out of shell versus that uh, preform was made out of bone. 
Maybe you can just zoom in and kind of take a look at the textures and the, the wear patterns that were used to create the object. Okay, now we're gonna go jump to Keoho and Kahalu. Here's a, a nice example of a, a smaller koi or ads. Yeah, I'm just gonna kind of give you guys a quick overview of different types of objects and different material types, just kind of see how the, the 3D modeling kind of shows up what how it representative it is but again you can really see the details of how the object was made you know how the areas were flaked off you can see the polished areas in relation to the rougher areas you can see the, the cutting surface different type of basalt artifact, um, but with a different type of texture compared to the polished uh, fine grain basalt. This is more of a secular porous type used for a sinker. One of the things that you're probably noticing is there's a lot of these numbers painted onto the artifacts. That was a, a practice that you know, occurred, you know, back in the earlier days of archaeology. Um, I don't believe it's practiced anymore nowadays. Um, you know, we wouldn't really want to damage or impact the object, but this is something you probably see with a lot of older collections. It looks like in this instance, they put some sort of base layer, and I think a lot of times they like to use, like, white out or things like that to kind of paint onto the, the artifact. We didn't talk too much about Makalavena. Um, it doesn't represent a large portion of our collection, but we do have some Koihana from there. And really, I think one of our most special Koihana in the West Hawaii collection is this Umeke that was found in a lava tube shelter in amazing preservation. Um, another great example of the 3D modeling technology and why it's so useful. Um, it's a very fragile artifact, not something we probably wanna have handled or even brought out very often. Um, but with this technology, you, you have that ability to look at, you know, in very fine detail, the wood grain, how it was worked. You can almost even look, peek inside the little puka. And you can kind of see the hole through there. Um, what's also amazing about this piece is that there's a net in the umeke. You can see the cordage and the weaving technique that was used for the, the net that's within the umeke. You can even see there's probably like some fish bone, some fish vertebrae inside the bowl. And one last thing I wanted to share with you guys is Trevor mentioned the collections-based research. Um, so this is the archaeobotany of Kaupulehu. We utilized um, charcoal samples that were collected, you know, back in the day from these um, Bahipupuna cultural sites in Kaupulehu. This is a map kind of showing the distribution of where charcoal was tested. Um, to do wood ID, and we also did um, radiocarbon dating to refine chronology. You can see blue is Malka sites, uh, yellow is kind of mid-elevation, and red are Makai sites. Some of these sites were also involved in the study that Trevor talked about for the fishing analysis. Um, this research was really brought out trying to assist one of our a community collaborators who does um, dry land forest restoration in Malko Kaupulehu. We thought it'd be great to look at these collections and to try and figure out, you know, what type of plants were occurring in these sites, you know, and based on the stratigraphy, the ages, you know, we can try and reconstruct, you know, pre-Western contact, you know, what, what was the vegetation like, what was the forest like, 
Uh, other things that we could figure out is, you know, looking at the ethnobotany, the traditional traditional uses of the sites. You know, what types of activities are occurring at the sites. You know, what type of plants are being used, and then how are plants being moved around? You know, was was there a lot of transfer of Malka to Makai, vice versa, um, and sharing across the landscape? So this also is part of um, a large interpretive poster that we created that we've actually shared out with our community collaborators and Kupuna and descendants that we engage with in Kaupulehu and some of our educators that we collaborate with. We also thought this would be great in the digital format. Um, so the focus of it really was, for me personally, I was, I was very intrigued and fascinated by the beauty of these cross sections of charcoal. Um, so you, and there's a unique signature for each different plant species in the charcoal. So you'd you know, take a slicing of the charcoal and it, with a high magnification microscope, this is what you see. And there's these various diagnostic elements that help to identify what species you're looking at. And so there's these pores and vessels, and then these rays are the primary components that we look at. Um, here's an example of comparing two different cross sections of two different types of plant. We have the Okio Lehua and Kukui. These are the charcoal cross sections. And then you, know, you can definitely see major differences between the two types. And with that, we kind of compiled this selection of cross sections that show uh, sampling. This isn't everything, but this is a good sampling of all the different plant species that we identified from this study. And we thought it would be a great interpretive poster to share with the community. Um, it's something you don't see every day of at this level, you know, this what the plants look like. And Trevor brought out a great point is we're actually looking at the kupuna plant with the current generation plant because the kupuna plant is the charcoal, right? We've got, these are charcoal slides from sites that, you know, some of them are almost 700 years old. And so here we have other information that we've included, um, the scientific name of the plant, uh, whether it's endemic or indigenous or a Polynesian introduction, um, when we are finding it, in the assemblage, like what's the chronology, we're starting to see it present. And what I really like is the traditional use of the, the ethnobotanical aspect of how these plants were used traditionally. Here's a look at Iliahi and sandalwood. Um, these colored boxes correspond to that first map that I showed. Um, so here, the Iliaki was found both in Malka sites and in Makai sites. So kind of showing there probably was resource gathering happening from Malka going to Makai. And with that, I think I'm proud with the website. I want to show you guys real quick some examples of the 3D printing. So I'm going to exit my screen. And then show you guys some of the printed models. Okay. So this is the, the sinker that's part of a Hei lure that I showed. This is a, a 3D printed model. This is not the actual object. Um, the technology is, is pretty amazing the detail, apologies, it's probably hard to see on this format. Um, this is uh, one of the koi that I shared. You can see how it was worked on the back versus the polished side on the front, the cutting edge. This is the, the fish hook preform. shoot, sorry, it's blurry. Kind of see on the back more of the texture where the bone was exposed. There's the little shell fish hook. 
I think I forgot to show this 3D model, but it was on one of our slides. This is the a turtle bone scraper, a pretty unique find for us, part of our uh, Kahalu'u collection. Um, pretty unique. And again, you can see the amazing detail of the 3D printing for this. Again, this is all printed. This is not the original object. And with that, I'm Pao, uh, mahalo for your time and looking forward to any questions if anybody has questions. Uh, so mahalo nui, um, John and Trevor for that amazing presentation, um, sharing what you folks are doing with this program and all the graphics and digital printing. It's really, really amazing to see how progressive and how um, you know the stewardship of Koihana is really being able to move in a direction that's more sustainable for our culture for one and um, the research too in the community. Um, but at this time, I, we're gonna open it up for questions from our participants. And we're also gonna be stopping the recording right now. Um, Amber is gonna go ahead and stop the recording.